In our last video, we destroyed the source of the Master's mutants, the Mariposa military base. While talking with the lieutenant of that facility, we learned that the Master was hiding out with the children of the cathedral. We then found a holotape where we discovered that the Master is really Richard Gray, one of Harold's old traveling companions. Richard Gray quite literally outgrew the Mariposa military base, and so he left it to travel to the cathedral south of the Boneyard, where we think he likely found a vault. We learned from Lorraine at the Boneyard that there is a vault beneath the cathedral, making it the most likely place for the Master's secret lair. And so we head south, past the Boneyard, to arrive at the Cathedral. As we arrive, four members of the Followers of the Apocalypse arrive from the West. This is the help that Nicole said she would send with us. She also told us to meet with a spy whom she has posing as a child of the Cathedral. When we find her, we're supposed to share with her the passphrase, Red Rider. Outside the cathedral, we find many robed individuals, and one of them recognizes us. He says that he's heard of our exploits around the wasteland, and he wonders what brings us to the cathedral. We can tell him that we're here because we've heard strange stories about the cathedral, and when we ask him what's going on here, he says, We're getting ready for war. We're gonna save the world, so we can fill it with all this peace and unity bullcrap. Well, looks like we found a child of the cathedral who really doesn't believe what they're preaching. Perhaps he's just here for the food and shelter. If we try to feign mock shock at how sarcastic this guy is being, he dismisses us and says we should probably go talk with someone else. If we ask him why he is here, if he thinks the unity spiel is all bullcrap, he very practically says, well, I'd rather screw someone else than be screwed myself. We can then ask him for details, but all he can tell us is that he hears that the children are getting ready to move north. But at this point, he becomes hesitant to talk with us anymore out in the open. So changing topics, we can ask him about the children of the cathedral leadership here at the cathedral. He says that they're led by a man named Morpheus, and we can find him at the top of the tower. This child doesn't have a lot of respect for him. He says, the guy dresses in black. He does his preacher act. Then he goes upstairs and counts his money. But then he stops himself and says, I can't talk about this anymore. The Nightkin might hear. When we ask him what he could possibly be afraid of, he says, you've got to be joking. The Nightkin are killers. You look at them the wrong way and they'll cut off your body parts, cook them, and feed them to you piece at a time. They can't be killed. They're the master's enforcers, and they're gonna tear apart this world for him. He then tells us about a man named Lasher who works here. He says, man, stay away from him. He's completely... I don't know if I can really describe him. Imagine the one person on Earth you don't want to know. Lasher is worse. Wow, so it really looks like some of the children of the cathedral haven't bought into the cause and are here because they're afraid or they have nowhere else to go. Moving forward, we find a man labeled a teenager standing in front of the door. He says, uh, hello. He's not really useful. He tells us a lot of things we already know, but we learn that he's primarily afraid of the Nightkin. He thinks that if they catch him talking, they'll eat him. His job here is to give out flowers. That's why we found a flower on one of the super mutants' corpses inside the Mariposa military base. Every petal of a flower symbolizes peace, and the stem is to symbolize unity. At least that's what he thinks. Then he gets confused. He says, oh, wait a minute. Do the petals signify unity and the stem signifies peace? He can't remember, but he offers us a flower. When done talking with the teenager, we can enter the cathedral, and unlike at the Mariposa military base, our support enters with us. At Mariposa, the paladins stayed outside, but these followers of the apocalypse waltz in with their spears in hand. We see robed children in the pews and two screens behind the lectern. One flickers a face and the other one says, Pray, follow, unity. Pray, follow, unity. We'll start exploring by heading into one of the rooms to the left here. Here we find a robed woman. We find a joke from the developers here. We find an option to say, you know, every time I talk to someone, people keep repeating the same thing they say over and over again. And he says, yeah, I know. I have a tendency to do that too when I have nothing original to say. See you later. Ah, the limitations of a video game RPG. This guy also appears to be a reluctant follower. If we say, oh yes, I have found this place so interesting, praise the master, praise the holy flame, 
She says, right, sure, of course, see you later. So she mocks us if we answer earnestly, or at least in mock earnestness. But if we make fun of the children by saying, I have seen higher forms of entertainment, she gets offended and says that this place isn't about entertainment, it's about enlightenment. More importantly, it's about making the right choices about the destiny of the world. See you around. So at this point, I can't tell if she cares about the children's cause or not. At any rate, moving north, we find another room with two more children inside. Hello, my brother. May I be of service this glorious day? What kind of services do you offer? But I only meant... Oh. <clears throat> I have to go now. We can try talking with her again. Well, hello again. Are you just walking, or may I help? Can I ask you a few questions about the children? Oh, I'm hardly an authority. You should see Morpheus, the high priest. I'm sure he can help you much more than I. This must be Laura, the spy from the Followers of the Apocalypse, whom we were told to meet with once we got inside. We'll come back to talk with Laura later. For now, we'll continue exploring. Heading into the sanctuary, we can take the first door to the right. Here we find a robed man who acts as a merchant. We can buy a small store of chems and a whole lot of flowers. But more importantly, this is one more opportunity to get a Children of the Cathedral robe, if we didn't have one already. Though to get it, we do have to kill him. Heading out of the shop and moving north, we find two armored people standing by a door to the east. This is Sister Frances. She gets upset at us for interrupting her meditation. We learn that their leader Morpheus hasn't given sermons in a very long time. She thinks it's because he and and many of the other leaders are too busy getting ready for their crusade. Her dialogue here, however, is different if we talk to her while wearing a robe of the children of the cathedral. She addresses us as brother. We can ask her to share with us some of her meditations, and they disturbingly go like this. The master is my friend. Unity is prosperity. Peace is prosperity. Peace and unity come through obedience. Obedience is proven through submission to authority. He who submits will be christened by the holy flame, but the faithful will not be burned. He who goes through fire without burning shall have life everlasting. I hope I didn't miss anything. I believe this is an allusion to dipping in the vats. The FEV is the fire, and to survive the dipping while retaining your intelligence is to survive the fire without getting burned. Next to her is a man named Ton, and he says he's happy to talk with us, but he warns us, look, if I hear the word praise, I'll kill you. He's just here because the children of the cathedral give him a roof over his head, a place to sleep, and three square meals a day. The ensuing violence, the master's war, he doesn't mind. He says, hey, this gives me a chance to kill the people who used to screw me over. What more do you want from life? So it seems like the master's recruitment standards are not very high. He's recruiting anyone who's interested, even if they don't believe in the unity. Moving to the western side of the auditorium, we can open the southwestern door. This is Dr. Wu, and he's not very pleasant. He begins cussing us out as soon as we start talking with him. He refuses to answer questions. He refuses to share his rubbing alcohol with us in case we wanted to get drunk. He is happy to heal us, but he does so clumsily. The vault dweller says, ow. We find an option to ask him if he ever puts people to sleep, and he says no, but the Nightkin do that, though sometimes he gives the Nightkin chems that they can use to put people to sleep. But why would the Nightkin want to put people to sleep? In the far northwestern corner, we find Lasher. My quarters are not open to those who have not been consecrated, he says. I must ask you to leave at once. We can beg his forgiveness and use the opportunity to learn more about the cathedral. Lasher says that the cathedral is a sanctuary for the human race. This allowed for the birth of the master, what he describes as a healing darkness from a terrible light. The terrible light being the nuclear apocalypse of 2077. When Lasher here arrived, he saw that the cathedral lacked a moral center, so he has taken it upon himself to administer teaching pain to the children here. 
The truth is, he's a sadist, and he simply likes beating his underlings with a cattle prod. We get different options if we arrive while wearing a Children of the Cathedral robe. We can pretend like we feel that we lack moral righteousness, and when we ask him how we can attain righteousness, he gives us a lecture about how no one should fear mutation, trying to argue that normal human conception is a mutation of some sort. It's a mutation of our parents' DNA, therefore we are all mutants which is a bit of warped reasoning. But why would he tell one of the members of his religious order not to fear a mutation? He almost gives us the impression here that many of these children are destined for the vats. He tells us that we should embrace pain as our closest friend, for pain is the most instructive force in the universe. We must inflict ourselves with pain until we break, which allows us to no longer exist as an individual. Only then can we be remade into the master's tool. That is the solution to all of our problems. When we ask him why they call him Lasher, we learn that he carries a cattle prod with him. He calls the rod his holy instrument, through which he instructs his charges with pain. Pain clears the mind of evil thoughts and allows them to better comprehend the glory of the master. Despite his reputation, we can insult him and his faith without him turning hostile. He tells us that we can find Morpheus at the top of the tower, but that we should be careful because the tower is guarded with Nightkin. If we ask him to persuade the Nightkin to allow us to pass, he says that's a reasonable request. Take this symbol. Show it to the Nightkin when you wish to pass. With that, he gives us a red Children of the Cathedral badge. We'll use this later, but now that we've talked with everyone on this bottom floor, we can head back south to check in with Laura. Hello, my brother. May I be of service this glorious day? Are you Laura? I most certainly am. Did you want something? Nicole sent me to talk with you. Nicole? I'm so sorry. I don't believe I know anyone by that name. Well, she told me to tell you, Red Rider. I'm sorry, I, I just don't know. Follow me to a place where we can talk. With that, she brings us to an empty room to the southeast. So, what can I do for you now? I need to ask you a few more questions. <sighs> Make it quick. We can be creepy and say, what's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? Uh-huh. <laughs> Waiting desperately for someone to use that pathetic line on me. Or we can ask her what she's learned about the Master. Uh, not much. The children worship him, and sometimes a huge vision of him appears in the main nave of the church. So he is real? Yes and no. I snuck up to the front one day, and I found a strange mechanical device with a lens under the altar. Sounds like some sort of hollow projector. So, I'm pretty sure this master is flesh and blood. And I also think I know where he is. Where's that? Every once in a while, Morpheus will go through a secret staircase leading below the church, and he enters a secret door with some kind of a key. I think the master's down there. Down there, below the church, maybe in a secret vault? I think we're getting somewhere. But Laura, do you know where the key is? Well, I'd say he keeps it on him. Can you show me to the door? Well, of course. Great. Let me ask you a few questions first. Okay, but we have to hurry. What are the children's plans? The children are setting up hospitals all over the place. I think they're trying to get people to trust them. We can say that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Actually, it's a good way to manipulate people. And this master is damn good at it. No, Laura, I meant that's the stupidest thing I've heard from you. You're paranoid, aren't you? Excuse me? You heard me. Oh, I see, that's real funny. Look it, I'm in the middle of this day in and day out. You have a problem with how I do this, you just keep it to yourself. Got it? What are you gonna do? Whine some more? <laughs> and with that, she attacks. Yeah, we insult Lasher and his faith up and down, and he doesn't attack. But we insult Laura, our ally, and she turns hostile. Or instead of insulting her, we can say, So, they're building hospitals as a recruitment tool. Is it working? Oh, it sure looks that way. I mean, people are flocking to their church. Can't they see it's a fake? Are you sure it is? For one thing, people seem to disappear a lot around here, while the number of Nightkin are slowly growing. 
And this makes sense when added to the information we got at the Mariposa military base. Remember in Richard Gray's log, we learned that his main reason for leaving the military base and coming to the cathedral was so that he could acquire more biomass. We just learned from Doc Wu that he doesn't put people to sleep, but that the Nightkin do. And that the Nightkin sometimes use Dr. Wu's drugs to put them to sleep. Why are they putting them to sleep? So they can kidnap them and bring them to the Master. Why does the Master need them? So that the Master can consume them and turn them into super mutants. And this explains why the people keep disappearing, but the Nightkin seem to grow. The people vanishing are being turned into Nightkin and other mutants. And this explains why the Master's recruitment standards don't appear to be too high. You don't even have to believe in the Unity to join the Children of a Cathedral. Because after all, you're just going to be consumed by the Unity and become part of it. Your faith in it is irrelevant. With that, she brings us to the northeastern corner of the church and unlocks a door. She then brings us past a staircase and down a hallway to the west. Only Morpheus has the key to this door. I must leave now to let Nicole know what's going on here. If we try to talk with her again, she says, please, I have to get away from here before they find out who I am. And with that, Laura walks away. So she brought us to the door that leads underground, but she doesn't have the key, and this door can't be picked. But she surmised that Morpheus has the key, and Morpheus is at the top of the tower. So to continue, we must go upstairs. With Lasher's badge in hand, we can explore this second floor. We find three rooms, and in two of them we find Nightkin. However, the Nightkin on this floor are always hostile. Even if we're wearing Children of the Cathedral robes, if we're traveling with any companion. This includes the followers of the Apocalypse traveling with us, and Dogmeat. Dogmeat, whom we can't tell to wait anywhere. We could talk to them and show them our red badge if we didn't have any of these companions, but since we do, they're all going to attack, which kind of defeats the point of wearing the robe to begin with. But we gotta keep this on our inventory anyway, because Morpheus won't talk with us unless we're wearing it. So bypassing the two rooms to the left, which just have Nightkin in them, we can open the door to the right, which has a man in a robe. But this isn't Morpheus. This man appears to be insane. Every time we try to talk with him, he says something else that's just random and nonsensical. Your poetry sucks, man. It sucks, sucks, sucks. I want a horse. I need a horse. Bring me a horse, damn it. A horse. Shut up, you jerk. Pull yourself together. You're fools to cry for me. Never cry over spilled milk or damaged goods. I just want to set the world on fire. So are penguins and gyro buffalo. They shoot them out of great big bison guns. You gotta watch out for those buffalo women. They'll drop a bison on you so fast you won't know what hits you. Ha! I used to live in Pentington, British Columbia. Or maybe I saw it on a map of the old days. Those were good old days. Wish I'd been alive back then. Why can't I be the important one for a change? I'm bored. What's worse, I've been screwed over. It isn't fun anymore. You ever got the feeling you were just strings and they didn't bother to hang you? I'm all over the floor. Doggone it, I'm a puzzle. Will you help me put myself together? Why do you think they call him the master? And then there were the ones who lost their minds completely. I wish they were dead. Yeah, he goes on and on and on. I finally just got too tired. I didn't bother to exhaust every crazy thing he could say. So moving on, we climb this second staircase to the third floor. But this time the Nightkin are patrolling the hallway. We simply can't avoid them if we're here with companions. So putting on our power armor and taking out our plasma rifle, we can kill the Nightkin. The Nightkin are just super mutants who are using stealth boys. We learn later during the events of Fallout New Vegas that prolonged Long use of stealth boys has psychological effects on the Nightkin, giving them schizophrenia. But apparently this early in Fallout's history, they have yet to suffer from schizophrenia. When the Nightkin are dead, we can loot. We find stealth boys on their corpses, which can come in handy. In the bookshelf to the west, we find two books, a first aid manual, and a scout handbook. In the bookcase in the room in the middle, we find a big book of science, a dean's book of electronics, and a guns and bullets. There's a locked footlocker in this room. Inside, we just find a 10 mil and a few other minor goods. And here's where having the followers of the apocalypse here just gets frustrating. 
we already have four companions counting dogmeat, with all four of the followers that brings our companions up to eight. This hallway is so narrow that I constantly got stuck in these doorways just waiting for someone to move to leave one hex open so that I could move forward. Moving to the room to the east, the bookshelf is empty but there is a locker on the ground that we have to unlock. We find quite a lot of ballistic ammunition, including dynamite and flares. But that's it for floor number three, so next we'll take the staircase to the top floor, floor number four. Thankfully, the Nightkin are in their own room. We see Morpheus in the room to the east, but he, like the Nightkin, is hostile on sight if we come here with companions. So in order to capture this conversation, I had to come back on a separate game save after having killed Dogmeat, since there's no way I could have dismissed him. But if we're alone, we can address Morpheus. I don't remember inviting anyone to my room, and yet I have a visitor. Why? There are a few ways to go about this. First, we can pretend to be a child of the cathedral. Hi there, I'm Oxhorn. What's your name? I ask the questions, not you. Now, tell me what you are doing here. I'm just lost. Well, my child, it's quite dangerous to explore places where you do not belong. Where were you heading that you ended up in my private chambers? Well, I'm new, and I was looking for the bathroom. What of the other high priests sent me up here? Ah, uh, <laughs> that would be Lasher. He so loves getting the worshippers in trouble. This is your lucky day, my ignorant little friend. You may leave now without incident. With that, we can leave peacefully, but if we try to talk with him again... You were warned. Guards! Ooh, <laughs> that was creepy. Alternatively, we can be up front with him and say, well, I'm not really lost. How surprising. Now tell me why you are here. Because I have a deal for you. What could you possibly offer me? I'd like to offer you some information about your enemies. And who might my enemies be? Well, the followers of the apocalypse, for one. Tell me what you know. Let's just say I know something to help you out against them. Give me the information, or die a slow, lingering death. Not so fast. I want to know what I can get from my information. You may keep your life. Now, tell me what you know. We can try to bypass this guy and say, no, 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 I'm not going to talk with the hired help. I'd like to give your master a bit of information about my vault. I do not have a master, you imbecile! Then who do you call the master? Doesn't he control you? No one controls me. He and I are partners. It doesn't matter. I have information about a vault he would want. Fine. I will take you to the master. But if you are lying, you will know. Yeah, well you better not backstab me. You think the master would be happy if you killed a vault dweller? Ah, so you are the vault dweller I've been hearing about. Surprised? I have my sources. Now I will take you as a gift to the master. He'll be very pleased. And with that, he teleports us to the master. This is a great way to get there quickly, but we're going to take the long route. If we explain why we're here by saying, Oh, you know, one of the other brothers sent me up here. I suspect you are a spy sent by the followers. I may be wrong, but I do not take chances. You must be eliminated. He turns hostile. Or we could pretend to be a spy from the Master by saying, I was sent here by the Master. He wants me to spy on you. A spy? Very foolish of you. It will be difficult to report to him when you are dead, won't it? Either of those two options, and any option that insults him, causes Morpheus and the three Nightkin on this floor to all turn hostile. This is a tricky fight, but the good news is that Morpheus is stuck in this room, and if we position ourselves correctly, we can force the Nightkin to fire upon us one at a time. When the Nightkin are dead, we can loot Morpheus' body. We find some super stim packs, a hunting rifle, and two Children of the Cathedral badges. A red one like the one we already have, and a black one. This black one is what we'll use to head downstairs. 
Exploring the rooms to the west, we find an electronic lockpick in one of the bookcases, and in a locker between two beds, we find Tesla armor, along with a power fist. The Tesla armor has a completely unique icon. It almost looks like power armor, but on our character, it looks like simple metal armor. It has many similarities to power armor, but quite a few differences as well. It only weighs 35 pounds, compared to the hardened T-51 suit of power armor's 100 pounds, or 85 pounds if not hardened. At first, it looks much inferior to the power armor, with a DR of 20 and a DT of 4, compared to the hardened power armor DR of 50 and DT of 13. However, when we take a look at its resistances, we see that it has the same laser resistance as the hardened T-51 power armor. It has 30 greater plasma and electrical DR, but 40 less explosive DR. So the Tesla armor is actually a superior piece of armor against energy weapons. And this is confirmed by the lore behind this armor, which we actually don't learn until the events of Fallout 2. The Tesla armor was manufactured before the war based on plans created by none other than Nikola Tesla. In the Fallout universe, the United States government confiscated the plans after his death. It is fantastic against energy weapons, but since there are superior choices against ballistic damage, its popularity was very niche. Though we learn from Fallout 2 that some suits found their way into National Guard depots. If one doesn't have the hardened T-51 suit of power armor, this is an essential suit of armor for an upcoming battle. Now that we have the key, we can descend the tower. Though before we do, notice that we see the boneyard off in the distance. On the right, I think we see Attitude. But on the left, I think that's the library. Back on the ground floor, we can use the black key to open the locked door to the east. But as soon as we open it, even if we're wearing a cathedral robe, we get attacked by a nightkin hiding behind a wall at the end of the hall. His aggression and our subsequent defense turns most of the children in the cathedral hostile, and we have to take them down. When done, we can leave the ones who didn't go hostile, go down the hallway, and take the staircase to the basement. In the basement, we can move south. We find a big book of science lying on the ground next to a bookshelf. And moving far to the east, we find a dead end. But Katya says there's something funny about that bookcase on the east wall. Looks like it's hiding something. We can nose around here, but we don't have to for long. Because our companion sandbox script apparently doesn't consider secret doors. Tycho just walks right through it and opens it up for us. But if we don't have a companion, it's much harder to get through. The black badge doesn't work on this door. We can't use lockpicking to pick it. We can't use repair to repair it. Using science doesn't tell us anything about it. And we don't find a lever or a switch by the bookcase. The only way I was able to open it was to either wait for a companion to walk through or we can wait for it to open on its own. And out from the cave walks a man named Jeremiah. Jeremiah will be hostile if we're not wearing a disguise, but if we are wearing a disguise, he just walks on by. And if we do choose to talk with him, we can simply tell him that we are on an errand for the master. On the other side of the wall, we find ourselves in a cave filled with centaur and floaters. This is the secret entrance to the Los Angeles vault. The Los Angeles vault was built by vault Tech, but it was never given a number. And that's because it was built as a demonstration vault. It was the first vault ever built by vault Tech. They built it as a proof of concept when trying to secure government funds to start the project and as a marketing tool for convincing prospective residents. As a demonstration vault, it's a fully functional vault, complete with fusion reactor. But it's much smaller than a typical vault, and its layout is much different. When the bombs dropped on October 23rd, 2077, the people of Los Angeles flocked to this vault, since no one was living in it at the time. It was a demonstration vault. It is this vault that kept them alive long enough for them to emerge to become the founders of Aditum and the gangs of the Boneyard. After fighting our way through the master's pets, we arrive at the vault door. The vault door is guarded by two super mutant guards wielding powerful high-tech weapons. We can get by these guys if traveling by ourselves and if we're wearing a cathedral robe. However, we have to pass the right speech checks. When they stop us and ask us what we are doing, we can't antagonize them and instead have to answer, I'm on important business. You have no right to stop and question me. 
When he waves us on, we have to say blessings to your brother, but if we question him, he becomes suspicious and attacks. Alternatively, we can fight our way through. In this cave, we see a great deal of the Master's army, and it makes us wonder, when exactly does the invasion start? Is there ever a moment in the game when the Master invades the wasteland? Does he ever attempt to find Vault 13 on his own? Well, in the original release of Fallout 1, in addition to the 150-day water chip timer, there was an invisible countdown timer of 500 days that started the moment we left Vault 13. This timer gave us 500 days to blow up the Mariposa military base and defeat the Master before the Master's army invaded Vault 13. We're given no indication how far along this timer is at any moment in the game. Instead, we see an end-of-game cinematic, like the ones we saw in yesterday's video, once 500 days expire. However, we make it even worse for ourselves if we hire the water merchants to deliver water to Vault 13. The idea goes that in order to deliver water to the vault, we had to give the location of Vault 13 to the water merchants, and somehow the children of the cathedral got their hands on this information, whether by treachery from the water merchants or infiltration, we don't know, and delivered it to the master. If we tell the water merchants where they can find Vault 13, our 500-day countdown timer until the mutant invasion instead becomes 400. On day 90, the mutants sack the LA Boneyard. On day 110, they destroy the necropolis. On day 140, they decimate the hub. On day 170, they destroy the Brotherhood of Steel. On day 200, they make it all the way to Junktown. On day 230, they obliterate Shady Sands. And then on day 400 or 500, depending on our choice, they finally make it to Vault 13 and the game ends. However, the developers patched this out of the game in a downloadable update, update version 1.1. The reasoning, I think, is that they didn't want to punish people for playing the game. There's this invisible countdown timer. You have no idea that the mutants are on their way to Vault 13. And the more you play the game, the more you explore the world, the worse it gets for you. Kind of disappointed a lot of players who invested all that time in their characters only to realize that they had to start completely over. So patch 1.1 of Fallout added years to this mutant invasion, but those playing the game straight from the CD can still experience the mutant invasion. Knowledge of this game mechanic will become important later. We can use our science skill on some of the computers inside the entrance to the demonstration vault to discover the location of the Mariposa military base if we hadn't done so already. There are some chems and medicine in a locker, but otherwise the entrance is empty. So to move forward, we can take the elevator to the west to floor two. Now, if we arrive at floor two in power armor and go guns blazing, we miss a little bit of lore. So exploring first in a Children of the Cathedral robe, we can move south to open a door into what appears to be some sort of operating room or laboratory. Here we find some human mad scientists. The mad scientists greet us and ask us what we are doing here. We can say that we're just checking up on their progress, and they reveal that things aren't going well. They've been injecting the FEV directly into the pineal gland of presumably their human captives, but they're not getting the results they had hoped for. Doing so results in increased psychic ability, but the side effect is that the subjects become terminally insane and must be sequestered and nullified to keep them from harming themselves or others. So FEV unlocks psychic abilities in humans? We can ask him where these subjects are kept, and he says in a room northwest of here. We can betray ourselves by asking, hey, what is FEV? And he's almost offended and begins to look at us suspiciously. Alternatively, we can try giving him advice and saying, well, you've tried injecting it in the pineal gland. Why don't you try injecting it directly in the amygdala? And he says, what an intriguing idea. I must try it at once. But we never find out the results of this experiment. Moving to the east, we find their super mutant guard. This is Vincent, and he is here to make sure the mad scientists stay on task. Leave them alone, he says, and get out. No one is allowed in here while they are sleeping. Moving south, we see some yellow force fields, behind which are a bunch of test subjects. Sadly, our radio doesn't work on these, but we can access a wall-mounted terminal to the east to free the captives. We're free, they scream, we're free! and they get destroyed by a blast of psychic energy. 
but at least we get 2,000 experience for releasing them. Who killed them? Was it the Master? Could the Master be a psychic? Or did they suffer a side effect from all of the experiments done to them? With this bottom half explored, we can head north. Here we see three rooms. One appears to be a seminar room. We see two mutants giving a presentation to three children of the cathedral. I believe in the master. His will is our salvation, says a child. And the mutants say, pray with us for peace, child. The unity will prevail if we are all strong. Meditate on the quality of strength. Heading out and moving to the room to the left, these are some of the other test subjects that the mad scientist told us about. The ones who had developed psychic powers by having FEV injected into their pineal glands. Directly in front of the door, we find a man in a green shirt named Gideon. He's a normal looking person, but we see that he's wearing a crown. Jason is a living god. Only the nullified may pass, says Gideon. Who's Jason, we can ask, and he goes, Jason? Who's Jason? And with that, we can go, uh, yeah. Are you the experiments I'm looking for? And he says, the walls also have mines. I saw you. Tomorrow? I'll take that as a yes, we can say. And then he says, meeting of the soul, melded with to protect the master of all. And we get the impression that he's trying to tell us something. We can say, I see. So how do I protect myself from the protectors of the master? And he says there is only peace and joining. The price, the pain. One must be blind, nullified. And with that we understand. The master does indeed have psychic powers. Psychic powers that allows him to communicate with his army, but powers that can cause pain or death to humans who are not protected. We can say, great. So, how do I join? So I too can get a nullifier. And he says, you cannot kill the genius of the all, you, herf. But we can reassure him and say, don't worry, I don't want to kill. I want to worship. He says, I will anoint you. I must give what I must not. When we say anoint, anoint me with what? We gain a thousand experience points for convincing the Psyker to give us a Psychic Nullifier. The Psychic Nullifier appears as a crown in our inventory. As long as we have it in our inventory, we are protected from the Master's Psychic Attacks, the results of which we saw on clear display when we released the captives from their cells. Inside this room, we find three other people Talking with Lucy, she says, There's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. And she paces back and forth. What about this place, we can say? Isn't this your home? My home is, uh, yeah, here. Yeah, it's here. This is my home. And she jumps up and down. I'm so happy. You can't believe how happy this makes me. I think I'm going to go punch the wall for a while. And if we try to talk with her again, she says, I'm busy. I almost have the solution to the environmental problems screwing this world over, but I can't stop thinking about purple dinosaurs. Is this a problem? The third man in the room says, I'm tired of living. The fourth man named Wiggum says, the asphalt shall run red. I will crush. We can say, what are you talking about? And he says, only the powerful can pass, but they will be kept from passing. But I have to see the master, we can say. And he says, Gideon. Gideon speaks the way. So this fellow points us towards Gideon where we can get a psychic nullifier. We can try to talk with him again. He says, I will stop the motor. The master gave me the power. Even though his name is Wiggum, we can say, Okay, Hank, I'd like to meet the master. How do I get there? Each of these bewildering conversations points us towards Gideon. So, looks like we already have what we need from these guys. Now that we have the psychic nullifier in hand, we can explore the final room on this floor to the northeast. Here we find two mutants having a conversation. If we're disguised, he treats us like a child of the cathedral. They don't provide any information, they're just here to get us in trouble in case we're not disguised. Which brings us back to our infiltration. If we're not disguised, this room presents one of the most difficult fights in the entire game. But mainly if you're trying to keep your companions 
companions alive. You'll notice here that I don't have any of my companions with me. That's because I left them on the floor above just so that they would survive. Even so, I still had to replay this battle over and over and over again if I wanted to keep Dogmeat alive. The key was to make sure that the mad scientists all attacked Dogmeat. Dogmeat's tough enough to withstand their attacks. And then for the Vault Dweller to hide behind walls after each attack when possible. Otherwise, they tear us to shreds with their miniguns. Then when the mutants from the north attack, step outside a door to fire a shot, then duck back in when they're in combat. In this way, after probably an hour of replaying this one battle, I was finally successful. Even if we're not dressed in a cathedral robe, we can still talk with Gideon to get a psychic nullifier. And with the psychic nullifier in hand, we can head back to the elevator and take it to the third floor. Upon arrival, we see biomass all over the floors and walls. Katya says, ugh, I think I'm gonna be sick. And we see an open door to the east. Inside, we find a bunch of Mr. Handys and iBots, but they're all hostile. They're quick and are likely to kill companions pretty swiftly. But if the Vault Dweller can grasp their attention, he has a good shot of living through their fairly weak damage, long enough to tear them down one by one. Alternatively, if one is wearing the Children of the Cathedral robe, the robots say, peace to you. Uh, I guess even the robots have been brainwashed. Continuing down the hallway, we find a roaming super mutant named Vicious. If wearing a robe, he says, the will of the master prevails. What news do you have for me? If we threaten him, he attacks. If we say, uh, the war goes well. He says, your manner betrays you, intruder. I will end the threat here. And he attacks. The only way past is to say that we have a message for the master from his lieutenant. If we do, he says, then use the door and beware of the corridor. I assume you have your protection in place? He must be referring to the psychic nullifier. Even he is afraid of the master's psychic powers. We can respond by saying, of course. Thank you. Unity prevails. And Vicious continues on his way. Or, if not wearing a costume, we can wait for Vicious to walk into the locker room. Then heading south, we can turn east, where we find a room filled in some sort of biological sludge, covering the floor in puddles and creeping into the crevice of every monitor and computer. Here we find four children of the cathedral and two super mutants. If wearing a robe, they do not attack. They say, we do the work of the master. But if not, they are hostile. Here a lot of AP is useful because the ones in robes go down pretty quickly. We can thereby quickly level the playing field. But I also had to replay this multiple times to avoid Dogmeat's death. Vicious will likely be drawn to the noise. He comes from the west and strikes hard, so we should pay attention to him when he arrives. When the room is clear, we can move northwest, where we find a door into the locker room. We can pick the lock with our lockpicking skill, and we have to pick the locks of all of these lockers. Inside one, we find nearly 400 caps. Another is filled with chems, at least two of every type of chem possible. In one, we find stacks of hundreds of 5mm ammunition, microfusion cells, and small energy cells. And in the last tall one, a bunch of thrown explosives. Next to this is a short one with a bunch of rockets. With this side of the vault floor clear, we now have an open path to the master. And I hate to do this to you, I really do, but sadly I'm out of time. But never fear, we'll confront the master and uncover his story in his own words in tomorrow's episode. In that episode, we'll also go over every single possible game ending in all of Fallout 1. I publish a video every single week here on my channel, so if you want to make sure you don't miss that episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a shirt shop with unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. My designs come on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, as we finally confront the Master.